What is Access? Access is a database. What is a database? A database is a software program where you can store and organize all of your data in two. For example, let's say I want to keep track of all the employees in my company. I want to be able to store their information, their first name, last name, date of birth, so I can send them a birthday card on their birthday, also their phone number, maybe their hourly rate or salary. All of that information I can create and store. And for each employee that I have, there's going to be a record. So for example, me, Kirk Kershaw, I have my first name, my last name in this database. Also, I'm going to have my home address, the hourly rate that I make. All of that creates one record, one record for each employee. Other things I can keep track of are like products. My company sells products, but I want to keep track of it separate from my employees. Now in Microsoft Access, to keep track of them separately, they have what are called tables. So this would be a table of information all about the employees who work for my company. And this would be a separate table of information all about products. And here, I would have things like the product ID, the product name, how much I have in inventory or on stock. Again, all about products. I also have orders. So every time a client makes an order, I want to keep track of the order. Maybe I have an order ID, also the date that the order was made. And then finally, we have the clients themselves. We have the company's name, or the first name, last name of the client, their address, shipping address, their credit card information on file. Now Microsoft Access is what is called a relational database. A relational database means that these tables can relate to each other. Let me put it to you this way. When you have a filing cabinet, you have information on your employees, your products, maybe the orders they made and when they made it. Do you dump them all into one filing cabinet or all into one folder? And let's say you just want to pull up an employee. That's really inefficient because first of all, you have to lift this 20 pound folder out. And then secondly, you have to sort through the products, your orders, just to get and find your employees. I mean, what a waste of time. So in a relational database, for example, you create again what are called separate tables or separate folders. And I've got four of them here. And what that means is, for example, if I want to pull up the clients, that's easy to pull up. But what if I want to pull up the clients and I want to keep track of all the products one client has purchased, like let's say client XYZ, then what I want to do is I want to create, again, Microsoft being a relational database, a relationship between the products and the clients. So I can come over here to the products and say, look, I want to extract some of this data. I want to find out for the products, let's say we sell essential oils. For all the essential oils we sell, I want to find out all the clients who purchased that. Maybe I want to do some target marketing to those clients. Not only that, but for every product that's purchased, it's through an order. So we're going to create a relationship from the uh, products to the orders. And of course, relate all the tables so we can actually pull information from one table and have it relate to the next. So if we have the clients related to the orders, if I just want to keep track of how many orders they made, I just, again, need these two tables. I don't have to pull up the employees. I mean, that makes no sense. So it really becomes more efficient when you break it down into the smallest, most meaningful parts, or in this case, tables here. All my orders are in one, all my products are in one table, all the clients are in one, and so on. Now, Access is more than just tables of information. In fact, what makes Access so powerful, once you create your tables or your data in these tables, is the ability to manipulate that data and pull in what you want, when you want. So for example, let's say I've got 200 employees. I don't want to go through each employee's records and find out if the employee has benefits or doesn't have benefits. I want to be able to instantly create a query and pull up all the employees who do not have benefits. Just filter out those who have benefits and filter in those who don't. Let's say out of the 200, it automatically pulls up 25 employees. I mean, that's fast, that's efficient, and that's what they call a query in Access. And then based upon that query, I could create a report, print that off and hand it over to HR and have them go ahead and contact these employees to be able to offer them benefits. Also, you can control how the information is being entered into your database, and in this case, into your tables. So for example, if I hired on a new employee, and I want to be able to have the first thing they enter in is the employee ID, and then go ahead and enter in the employee's first name, last name. Just think of it this way. Have you ever done shopping over the web, and you've gone to a web page, and you put in your first name, last name, and they had those fields up at the top here? Well, in Access, you can control where you place those fields and what fields come first. You can have the fields at the top of your form in the middle over to the right-hand side. In fact, let me go to the next slide in my PowerPoint presentation and break this down. Now, Access has what are called objects, and as we just learned in the previous slide, the foundation of all the objects are tables. Because, let's face it, without a table of data, you don't have a database. So we've got to have some data, and to store the data, we create a table and we break the data down into its smallest, most meaningful parts, in this case, tables. For example, 
We had a table all based upon employees. We want to keep track of all of our employees and keep that in a separate table and keep track of all the clients in another table, like their first name, last name, shipping address, and so forth. Now, before we go any further, I strongly recommend you actually watch our Microsoft Excel 2010 training videos if you're not familiar with Excel because Access has a lot of similarities to Excel except that Excel is a little more simplistic and is a great introduction to Access's tables. For example, I'm going to go ahead and click on this link here to open up my Excel 2010 workbook and give you an introduction into tables because Access table and this Excel, well, what they call a spreadsheet here, are the same in that they have cells. I can click in a cell there and these cells make up a spreadsheet in Excel or in Access, they would make up a table. And you can see over on the left hand side here I have a database on my Dreamforce's payroll and I'm keeping track of all my employees, their first name, last name, social security number. You see I've got all this information here and that makes up a database. And you can say look, if I can create a database in Excel, why don't I use Excel? Well you may want to use Excel to store your information to keep track of it because in Excel you can actually do some sorting like you can sort by last name you can also filter out those who don't have benefits, but on a very simplistic level, because Excel really wasn't meant to be the end-all of end-all databases. It's something to get started on. Also, Excel will perform functions and calculations, like for example, I have the hours for Max here, 40 hours, and how much he gets paid per hour. And what I did is I multiplied those cells to get the gross for that week. In fact, think of the Access database built for small to mid-sized businesses. When it comes to the hierarchical structure within Microsoft, Excel is a way to start learning about databases and how to perform calculations, and then Access is the next step up. For example, in Excel here you cannot print reports or design a report. What you see here is what you get. It's face value. So let me go ahead and close out of Excel here and come back to my PowerPoint presentation and finish off our objects. So once we have our data, our raw organized data, the tables, then we can go ahead and query out the information from those tables. We can say, look, we want to see all the employees who do not have any benefits. That's what's called a query. It instantly filters out those employees who do have benefits and only pulls in those who don't. That way you don't have to scroll through hundreds or thousands of records to find those who don't. On top of a query, Access has what are called forms and reports. Again, a form is something you can create as a place where you can organize the fields and control how the user inputs the data into the table because again a table is where you store all the data so this is just basically a place where you can actually type in information once you type it in it dumps it right into the table and forms you can make look really nice think of it like this way like a report a report is information you're taking from the table but in an organized way just as a form is a way of entering in information a report is a way of pulling out information in a nice organized manner and then finally, I want to be able to define those objects a little bit more in detail. So a form by definition will display the information from the table or query, because again, a query is based upon a table, or you can enter in new information, new data, new records, so that's a form. It's a way of being able to control what the user inputs that's going to store in the table, and the table again is raw organized data. Report is the printable results of forms or queries. You can actually turn a form into a report and print that off, and again, forms are based upon either queries or tables, and queries are always based upon tables. And what are queries? It's just another way to retrieve data from a table to be able to filter in and filter out specific information you want to see or don't want to see. And finally, again, emphasizing the table. Without data, without information, without records, without names, addresses stored, you don't have a database. I'm going to go ahead and end my PowerPoint presentation here and take you right to my desktop. I'm going to go ahead and put the access icon on my desktop so anytime I need to open up or close access instead of doing it from the start menu which I'm going to have to do it well the first time let me go ahead and click down in the search field I'm using Windows 7 let me go ahead and type in access 2010 and there it is I can go ahead and right click on it and say I want to send it to the desktop to create my shortcut click off in a blank area there's my shortcut then anytime I want to open up Access, I can just go ahead and double click on that uh, shortcut, that icon, or if you have Windows 7, you can also actually click and drag it and pin it to the taskbar. Now before I go ahead and open up the Access program, I want you to know that I'll be creating and saving all my database files into this folder here on my desktop, the Exercises folder. In fact, let me double click on it and open it up. I already have quite a few files in here. Let me ask you, which file belongs to which program? 
Well, there's two ways that you can find out. You can either look at the icon, which you can associate the colors there. This icon with that one, it must be access, or I don't know if you can see the uh, details of the icon, but if I come up here in the command bar and click on the uh, drop down arrow, and let's make the uh, icons large. Oh, there you go. Large A, large A must be access. I'm going to go back and click on the drop down arrow and go back to my tiny list view. That way I can manage more files within the smaller window frame here. The other way you can find out besides the icon is by looking at the other end, which is called the extension or the extended name of the file. In other words, anytime you're in a program and you save a file, you give it a name, right? Like I gave it table data, report basics, inventory, form basics. And then when I save it, immediately the operating system tags on an extended name. So it associates that extension or that extended name with that program, like ACC, Access DB Database, so Access Database. XLSX, Excel, and PPTX, or PPT, think of it, PowerPoint. Better yet, you can actually watch my Windows 7 will train video, and I cover all this. I'm going to go ahead and close out of here, and you can uh, either double click on one of those files to open up that file in the associated Access Database program, or just go ahead and let's double click on the icon here, and there's the Access program. So anytime you open up the Access 2010 program, this is going to be your starting view and it's going to ask you one of two questions. Either do you want to go ahead and create a database, either a blank one or using one of the templates down below, or do you want to go ahead and open up an existing database, either on your computer, you know, your desktop, or on the network. And I'm going to go ahead and open up one of my existing databases for two reasons. One, I want to show you what a completed database looks like, and two, I want to go over the environment so you have an idea later on when we go ahead and we create a database from scratch exactly what to expect. You also want to keep in mind that creating a database in Access is a process. It's not just a couple of clicks, but if you're patient, you'll find so much more flexibility when it comes to gleaning information out of your database. It'll be precise and organized. So to get started, I'm going to go ahead and click on the Open button. I'm going to come over here in the Navigation pane, click on the Desktop, because as you recall, coming over here in the main window, that on my desktop is my Exercises folder. Double-click on that. In that, I have all my databases. I'm going to go ahead and double-click on Books. And that's what a completed database looks like. Well, it's relative. A completed database doesn't have to have these other three objects. Remember, a database has to have at least one table, a table of data. And I've got three of them here. And then from that data, I can create a query and pull out and query from the data, not all of the information in there, but just bits and pieces. And then the forms can be based upon queries, which are based upon tables, a way of entering in information into my tables, and also reports, a way to pull information out of my tables, or I can also pull them out of queries, which are again are based upon tables. So over here in my navigation pane, you see these little arrows, I can collapse them so I don't see the tables, because you know if you have thousands of tables, I mean that could go all the way down, you can keep scrolling. So I can collapse it if I just want to work on my two queries here, or expand it and work on my tables. You can also click on this uh, drop down arrow, and you can say you want to filter by group, you just want to see queries. So all the other objects are hidden except the queries, so you can just work on queries. Click on the drop down arrow and you can do forms, or click on it and say you want to see all of the objects. That way you're not bogged down with scrolling if you have a lot of objects there. You could just work on one or another, but not all of them at the same time unless you want to. Now I want to go over the environment of access here, starting from top and going down to the bottom. Now starting up at the top in the upper left hand corner here, New to Access 2010 is that cute little icon. Over to the right you have what's called the Quick Access Toolbar. It's called that because you can quickly access the tools on that bar in a single click. If I wanted to save something, I could go ahead and click the Save button and automatically save it. I'll show you how to customize to add or remove icons from that toolbar in a later training video. And then over to the right you have what's known as the Title Bar because there's the title of my database books and then over to the right has the uh, name of the foundation of the database. In other words, back in Access 2007, Microsoft made some huge changes to the foundation of the program, and it's been carried over into Access 2010, which is nice. And then over to the right, you have the uh, name of the program that we have open. Again, it's Access. And then over to the far right, you have the Minimize, Restore Down, and then the Close, if you want to click on that button to close out of the program here, which we won't. Then down below you have what's called the ribbon. Think of it like one big large toolbar with a bunch of tabs up at the top. You want to go from one to another, just go ahead and click on those tabs. As you go from one tab to the next, you'll notice down below that you have a bunch of icons. If you want to know what those icons or buttons do, hover over it and it'll tell you. 
you can go ahead and create a table. And then you'll notice that there's a bunch of lines here that separate some of the icons from the others. Those are in what are called groups. So I have the tables group, the queries group, the forms group, and so on. And then you'll notice, let me go to another tab, if some of those groups have more information than what they can contain within that group, Access will have a little expandable dialog box button that when you click on it, it'll expand and open up another window or a task pane here, the clipboard pane. When you're done, just go ahead and close out of it. And then new to Access 2010 is the file tab. In the previous version of Access 2007, they had the Office logo there. In fact, you can see it, it looks like the logo down here for Windows 7, that when you clicked on it, it opened up a file menu. Well, when you click on the file tab, boom you're out of your database. Well, you didn't close out. You're in what is known as the backstage view. You're behind the scenes. So if you want to customize the environment of the Access program, you can click on Options, and I'll show you how to do that in a later training video. But to get back to my database to start working on it, you can do it one of two ways. Either come back up here and click on the File tab again, and it'll take you back to the tab that you are currently on. Like if I was on Create, I go File, click on File again, I go back to Create, or like I just showed you, if I'm back in the file backstage view, just go ahead and click on one of the tabs up there. So again, this is the only tab that will take you behind the scenes. All the other tabs are meant for you to work on your database and not in the backstage view. From time to time, when you're working on objects within your uh, navigation pane here, you'll see additional uh, what are called contextual tabs that are related to what you're specifically working on. In other words, it'll add some more tabs up at the top saying these tabs are only viewable with that particular tables or queries or forms or reports. In fact, if I go ahead and double click on the tables and open up the table in table view, and there you go. Remember what I talked about and what I just showed you in a previous training video about Excel being a spreadsheet with a bunch of cells? Well, that's what a table looks like, just a bunch of cells here organized. In this case, book number, the title of my books, and then the book price. And then notice up at the top, this is what I'm talking about, you have your basic tabs, then you have your additional contextual tabs that relate to that table. There's also another related tab, fields. So when I go ahead and close out, those related tabs disappear. Now if I don't have enough room here and my uh, ribbon is taking up a lot of vertical space, come over here and either click on the arrow here and it will collapse it, and then click on it to expand it again, or use the shortcut. Of course when you hover over it, it gives you the shortcut, Control F1, Control F1. So that way you got a little bit more room. And then the same goes with the navigation pane. If you're working on something over here and you have it open in, in the main window, go ahead and click on those uh, shutter bar open and close button to click on it once to close it, click on it once to expand it. And then finally, down below you have what's called the status bar. You'll get little prompts and notes. If there's any errors with your database, it'll list it here. Right now it says it's ready. You can also see over here I've got my number locks on just the status of your database. You can also right click on it and customize it. Number lock. If I go ahead and uncheck it, it disappears. Go ahead and check it, it pulls it back up. Click off in a blank area and we're good to go. Now if you need any help with your access program, you can come up here in the upper right hand corner and click on the access help button. Either click on that or you can see down below the shortcut key for the access help is F1. Go ahead and hit the key or click on the button here. Maximize the window. And there's a couple things that you can do in the Access Help window. One is you can go ahead and click on the table of contents. It opens up the task pane down below. And you can go ahead and flip through each book and start reading. Like for example, the basics, it opens up. Let's learn about introduction to tables. Click on that. It gives you a little overview, a synopsis, and then what's included in the article. You can click on the links here to take you right to it, like the overview. Here's an access table, and what makes up a record is all these fields, like the first name's a field, the company, the ID, and a field value is, well, what you would enter in a record, like the value of this field for this record is Antonio. Then for that record, number one is Anna and Thomas and so on. That's one way. Let me go ahead and close out of it, or you can go ahead and click in the search field and type in tables, and then go ahead and click on the search button. Now when you click on the search button, by default, it's just going to search the help file that was installed on your computer when you installed Access. In other words, if you click on the search drop-down arrow, you can see contents from this computer, Access Help, or Developer Reference, or if you want to search all of Access that's available not only on this computer, but any updates online from office.com, then come up here and check all of Access. 
so it searches not only your computer but again microsoftoffice.com and then you can come down here hmm, there it is introduction to tables click on it I don't think there's any additional information online but we can go ahead and check and scroll down well they have the same overview but in any case you can either read from the contents off of your computer or you can go ahead and search on your computer or from or from office.com just like a web page if you want to go back hit the back arrow if you're searching you want it to stop click stop if it's searching online you can go ahead and refresh it so update it if you're searching from office.com then of course you can go to the home page which is the home page for office.com go ahead and print it off change the font size of course the table of contents then you have the pin which means do you want to pin this window on top what that means is if I come up here and I restore this window back down when I click off the window typically it'll disappear and this window behind it will come to the front so it's pinned on this window to the top so I can move it to the side read over here the instructions and test it out over here in access but if I unpin it and I click off it disappears behind this window here to bring it back up of course down here any program that I have open is going to have a corresponding button down at the bottom to bring it up just click on it brings it forward to bring access forward click on that button and vice versa in any case bring it back up pin it that way when I click off of it it stays on top by default the access 2010 program has a window color or a color scheme of silver and mine's blue I went ahead and changed it to blue. If you want to go ahead and change yours to either blue or black, those are the only two choices that you get. Just go ahead and click on the File tab, go Backstage, go down and click on Options, and then come up here, click on the General Category, come down and where it says Color Scheme, click on the drop down arrow, and there you go. You got two other choices besides silver. Let me go ahead and change mine back to silver, click OK, and well, there you go, it's silver. Now, not only does it change it in Access, but any other Office 2010 applications that you have on your computer, it'll change all those at once as well. You can't just change one, it affects all of them. For example, if I come down here and click on the Start button and open up my PowerPoint 2010 application, it's also silver. So if I come up here in PowerPoint, File, Options, I went Backstage. It's got pretty much the same layout, there are options in all these applications, well, at least with the color scheme, and I go back to blue click OK there we go PowerPoints in blue and access and all the other office 2010 applications that I have on my computer another default that I want to show you is later on when we start creating our databases or we go ahead and we create one to get you started it wants to save it to the documents folder on your computer if you don't know where that's at or you want to save it to another folder come up here and click on the file tab and we're going to change the default by clicking on the options again coming up here making sure that general is selected then down here it says when you're creating a database what's the default folder that you want to dump that or create that in by default it'll say users your username and then documents folder if I want it saved to my exercises folder on my desktop which the address is already pointing to it but let's say it wasn't click on browse come over here in the navigation pane go to the desktop and there it is over in the main window exercises select it click OK and there we go it's pointing right to it the exercises folder and then click OK and like I said in a later training video when we go ahead and we create our first database it'll create by default into that folder of course keep in mind that default means that it's pointed to that folder it doesn't mean that when I'm in the process of creating it I can't change it on the fly I can it just means hey by default I'm gonna dump it here unless you change it on the fly and select another folder when you're creating it When it comes to customizing your quick access toolbar, and again they call it that because you can quickly access the tools or commands that you place upon it, as opposed to coming down here and bouncing around from tab to clicking on a command here, then another tab clicking a command there, just go ahead and place your more popular ones or the ones that you use more often up here, you know, having your ducks all lined up in a row where you can go ahead and just click on it and execute it, again without coming down here and bouncing around from tab to tab. Now there are many ways you can go ahead and add commands to your quick access toolbar. One way is to click on its drop down arrow and you got a list of some of the popular commands like quick print, click on that, adds it to the quick access toolbar. And what that does is that if I go ahead and double click and open up any one of these objects like my books table and I go ahead and click on it, it automatically shoots it right to the printer because again it's a quick print. 
it doesn't give me the little pop-up window that says, okay, how many pages do you want to print? Do you want to collate it? And so forth. Let me go ahead and close out of that. So if I don't like the quick print option, go ahead and right-click on the icon, and you can remove it from the Quick Access Toolbar, and it's gone. Click on the drop-down arrow again, and if I don't see a command here that I want, I can go down to More Commands. In fact, there's two other ways besides this way that you can get to the same window. Let me go ahead and close out. You can also right-click on the Quick Access Toolbar and go down to Customize. Brings up the same window, or if you're in the Backstage, click on the File tab. Now I'm Backstage. Go down to Options, and under the Categories, you have Quick Access Toolbar. Be sure to go ahead and select it, and it pulls up the same window. Now over to the left-hand side, we've got a list of more popular commands. Over to the right, we have a list of the uh, current commands that are found on our Quick Access Toolbar, and there's three of them. One, two, three. So if you want to add more, just come over here and select one of them, and click Add. Adds it over to the right-hand side. Better yet, let me select it and remove it. I can double click and it dumps it right over. That's a lot quicker. And then out of the popular commands, if I scroll down and I don't see what I'm looking for, change it from popular to all commands. So I have a view of all the commands that are available. And it's sorted alphabetically A to Z. So there's the A's. Let me go ahead and scroll down to, let's try to find the open command so we can open up databases. There it is double click, adds it, and then when I'm finished, now before I go ahead and click finish, you'll notice these commands that are already up here, they're kind of close together, aren't they? They're so close and tiny that I can accidentally click on one when I meant to click on another. So what I can do is I can add what are called separators and give me some more spacing in between these commands. So let me go ahead and scroll all the way to the top, and there's my separator command. So if I double click, I've added one. I can add more if I want. Let me add, how about three? So I have three separators, so I got a big huge gap between open and redo. Well, you know what? I would like to keep these two together, but not in between the undo and redo. So if I need to move these around, let me go ahead and select redo. I can use these up and down arrows. Let me push this up a couple of times so I can keep it next to undo, but I don't want them so close together, so I'll take a separator and move it up and bump it in between undo and redo, and then how about if I up the first and second separator. So I've got some spacing in between my commands here, so they're not so close I accidentally click on one when I meant to click on another. Click OK and boom, there you go. So a separator looks like a line, and I've got two lines or two separators in between my close. If I hover over it, it says close database, and there's my open. Then I added one separator in between my undo and redo. So that saves me time if I want to close out of my database here instead of clicking on file, going down to close database. Let me go back up and click on the file tab again so it takes me back to my uh, front view. I can just go ahead and click on the close database. When I do that, it closes the database but not the access program. Now the open doesn't work because I currently don't have a database that's open. That command's not available, but you know what? It's right there, so I might as well go ahead and just click and use that takes me right to my exercises folder, which is nice. So I can go ahead and double click and reopen my books. And then when I have my books opened, if I want to go ahead and open up another database, there's the shortcut Control O, or I can click on the open folder. And let's open up uh, CI2 Relationships. Double click on that. You'll notice that when I do that, the title changes from books to CI2 Relationships, of course, because that's the database I opened. It also closed my previous database the books. It doesn't keep the books open and then squeeze the relationships in. When I do it this way, you can only have one open at a time. So anytime I open up another one, like books, it closes the previous one. And again, in my Windows 7 training program, for every window that you have open up here, down on the taskbar you have a corresponding button. I only have one button. That's the corresponding window for this database. So I only have one database open. That's my books. And then finally, other way that you can add commands to your Quick Access Toolbar, is anywhere on the ribbon. So for example, let me go to the Create tab. We've got some active uh, commands here. I can go ahead and find a blank area in a group if I want to add a group to my Quick Access Toolbar. For example, if I right click and I want to add that to the Quick Access Toolbar, it adds the icon. I know it looks like the table icon, but really it's the group because when I click on it, it gives me the group. It gives me the group of icons that I can go ahead and choose from. Or if I want to more specifically add the actual command in the group, like this table, right click on it and say you want to add it. Now I know there are two icons here that look the same, but they're different because again, one that I click on 
gives me the group and the other one I click on actually creates the table. Well, it opens up and gives me a blank uh, table to work with and I can add all my uh, fields to it later on. Let me go ahead and close out and not save that. So there are many ways you can add your commands to the quick access toolbar. And again, to remove them, just right click and get rid of all these so it doesn't look too junked up. Now, as you recall in the previous training video, we were able to customize the quick access toolbar. Well, new to Office 2010, you couldn't do this in Office 2007, but in 2010 you can customize the ribbon here. And there's a couple ways you can customize it or open up the customization window. You can either click on the File tab and go down to Options, and be sure to select Customize Ribbon, and there we go. Let me go ahead and click Cancel, or better yet, just right-click anywhere on the ribbon and say you want to customize the ribbon. Brings up the same window. Again, just like the Quick Access Toolbar, over to the right we have a list of all the tabs that are on our ribbon, and over to the left we have a list of popular commands that we can add in addition to what we already have over here on the ribbon. So let's go ahead and say that we don't want to see the Home tab, which I don't recommend, but nonetheless you can uncheck it and say you don't want to view it. And in fact, how about if we take External Data, which is right here, and bump it before Create, select it, go ahead and hit the up arrow, click OK, the Home tab's gone. The uh, external data is before create. Boy, it's looking messy. Let me go ahead and right click anywhere, go down to customize the ribbon. If I get too far where I'm unchecking things and moving things around, I'm like, oh, I don't like this anymore. You can always click on the reset and reset all customizations, and it will delete all ribbon and quick access toolbar customizations for this program. Well, I haven't added any customizations to it. Basically, it's just going to reset what I messed up. So I click yes and it resets everything, it's back to normal. You can see it here, looks good. Speaking of which, if I want to go ahead and add new things to the ribbon, like a new tab, let me click on new tab, well it added it right here, and it's got the generic name new tab. If I want to go ahead and select it and say I want to rename it, and say my new tab is going to be called Spiffy. Click OK, and then for, well, I've got one group, how about if I go ahead and have two groups? So I clicked on New Group. I've got two of them there. So the first group, let's go ahead and rename. And we'll call it my Fonts group. And then I can go ahead and click OK. Now you've got a bunch of symbols up here that if you decide to add this group to the Quick Access Toolbar, that's the symbol that's going to represent it. I don't have to pick a symbol, but if I want to, let me go ahead and select the shield for fonts. I don't know, maybe the palette here of colors. Click OK. That's the icon that's going to represent it if we add that group to the Quick Access Toolbar as I just showed you in the previous training video. Let me go ahead and uh, rename that group and let's call it. And I'm not going to select any icons so you can see the difference when I do add it to the Quick Access Toolbar. It'll give me a default generic icon, but let me go ahead and click OK. OK, so I have my tab, I have my groups, but I don't have any commands within my groups. So let me select one of my groups and this is the font group. So I can come over here and we've got, let's see, in the popular commands here, we've got font color. Go ahead and select it and click add. Font size. This is interesting because I can't double click it to add it over. This is where I have to select it and add it. And format painter. Select it, click add. In any case, when I'm done with that, go to the next group. Cut, copy, and paste, and there they are. But if it's not under popular commands, go ahead and click on the drop down arrow and go to all commands so you can see all of them. And it's sorted from A to Z. And so if I go down to my C's, there's my cut, select it, click add, and then let me go ahead and scroll back up and there's copy, in any case you get the idea. Now when I'm finished all I have to do is go ahead and click okie dokie. Now before I do that, notice that Spiffy is between home and create. Let's click OK. Hey, there it is, Spiffy. So if I go ahead and select it, there's my two custom groups, fonts, cut and paste. So if I open up one of these objects down below, double click on it, I can choose, ugh, the icon doesn't look that great, but I can choose a font color if I want to change the color of my font, the font size. If I want to copy, cut, well, I didn't add paste to it. In any case, I've got my own tab with my own commands. Now, if I go ahead and, like I said, I want to add one of these groups to my Quick Access Toolbar or both, right-click in a blank area, don't right-click on the commands, and select Add. There we go. Remember the icon that I selected? That's the icon that represents this group. So when I click on it, it brings up the icons in that group. And if I right click in a blank area in this group and add it, it gives me a default green orb. So when you create your groups, you can go ahead and assign it an icon. So if you ever add it to the quick access toolbar, there it is. If not, then don't worry about it. It'll just give you a generic icon there. Then the only way you can find out about it is by hovering over it to find out the name of the group. 
I'm going to go ahead and right click, customize the ribbon, and like I said, you can go ahead and uncheck, hide, remove some of the commands here. In fact, if I expand it, select it, remove, it'll remove from my custom tabs, but if I go ahead and try to remove some of the commands from one of these groups here, it's faded. It doesn't allow me to do that because that's the default that the program was set up to have, so it doesn't allow us to customize that. If I'm done with this, I can go ahead and either uncheck it and then click OK, and it's not there, but it's available for later use by checking it, or I can go ahead and select it and click remove and it's gone for good. No way to bring it back. And then if I made too many mistakes, again you can go ahead and reset it to all the customizations or just whatever you have selected on the ribbon. In other words, if you made a mistake just on this one right here and you move some things around, just go ahead and select that tab and say you want to reset only the selected. Otherwise I'm going to reset all the customizations and click yes and go ahead and click OK and well, close out on my table and we're back to where we started here. And then finally, if you need to hide the ribbon because you want to have more space within your window here, you can double click on any one of these tabs. So double click will collapse it, double click to expand it. All of the objects that you see here have basically two views. They have a design view and a front end user view. The design view is where you go ahead and you design your reports, your forms, your queries, your tables so the front end user knows what to put in or what to see when they print it off in the reports. So for example for tables and queries when I double click on let's say the uh, books table I get the front end view, the data sheet view, I'm viewing the data. And I can customize this appearance by having a larger font. I think the font size right here is about 10. I can make the font larger, have it underlined. In any case if I want to customize the uh, data sheet view for either the tables or the queries you can come up here click on the file tab go down to options, click on the data sheet category, come down here, you can see, let's see, nope, it's size 11, let's make it size 16. In case if we have large monitors with tiny font, we can make the font a bit larger there. And then the weight, do you want it normal? Well, semi-bold, bold, underline metallic, click OK. And when I click OK, I have to close out of the database and open it back up before this will take effect. So let me go ahead and uh, select file, go down to close database. I can either click open, but down here you can see I have the, uh, well, the most recent databases that I've been working on, the top four, and there's the one I've been working on the most, or the latest, which is books. Click on that, automatically pops open. So when I open up my books table, the data sheet view, wow, okay, that's really annoying. I like the default, so again, it's file, going down to options, data sheet, the default was size 11, of course it was normal and it wasn't underlined or in italic, click OK. Close back out of the database, which is file to close database. And then again, because this was the most recent database that I had open, it's listed up at the top here, books, where I can click open, go to my desktop. Well, there it is, desktop exercises folder. Double click books, open up my table, and I'm in normal view. When it comes to viewing your document windows or these objects here, for example, when I double click on the books table, I get the tab, double click on the customers table, you can see when I open up all these objects, they uh, open up with these tabs. So I can easily see what's open and click on it to bounce from one to the next. That's one way. You have two other options. Let me go ahead and close out of these here. To change these options or to find out about these options, click on the file tab, go down to options, Go ahead and choose the current database and come down here where it says document window options. You have overlapping windows, tab documents, and display document tabs. First of all, the overlapping windows. This is the only setting that will allow you to position the open window around. In other words, with the tab, I couldn't position it because they're tabbed one on top of another. So let's see what this one looks like. Overlapping windows, click OK. Now in order for this to take effect, I have to close out of the database and reopen it. So I click OK, File to close the database and because it was the database I just recently had open it's going to be listed in my top four recent databases and the top one books so I can click on that open it back up so when I double click and open it it shouldn't have the tab because this is going to be the overlapping windows when I double click no tab double click again what happened to the books is it still there it is but the uh, customers tab is overlapping it so if I click and drag the uh, window header bar here you can see that one's overlapping another 
So I can click on that to bring it forward and, oh, how do I get to the other one? Well, another thing has changed when you choose this option is on the Home tab, there's a Windows group that's been added when you choose the overlapping Windows option because Access knows that it's going to be hard to click and drag to get from one to the next. Instead, just go to the Windows group and say you want to switch between the books or switch and bring the uh, customer's table to the top or to the front. Now you could look at this and say, well, that's annoying. Why would I want to do that? Well, I don't. When I'm designing my database, I like the tabs. I don't like to play back and forth and coming up here and wasting extra clicks by going to the window group and switching between the windows. But when I'm done designing the database, I remove the tabs. I just have objects that open up without tabs. So I don't have the users bouncing around, but I can control where they go. But for right now, know that you have those three options. Here's the first one. Let me go ahead and uh, close out of the tables here. Go to File, again back to Options, Current Database. Then we have Tab Documents. You can have Tab Documents, but don't display the document tabs. So unlike overlapping windows, this setting stacks the windows, and they cannot be moved around. In overlapping, we can move them around. You know, I clicked and dragged it. This one, you can't move them around. So if I select Tab Documents, but don't display the tabs, click OK. Again, it tells me I have to close out, so I click OK. Let me file to close the database, not the program. And again, I can go ahead and click on the link here. It opens it back up. Double click to open it up, and there you go. I don't have any overlapping windows. I can double click on customers. I now have two of the tables open, but I can't. Where's the option to restore it and move it around? I mean, if I click on this to restore it, it does the whole program, not just the uh, object that I have open or this table, the customer's table. Let me go ahead and maximize that. So the way around this is you can add to the quick access toolbar the switch window command. So I can go ahead and right click, go down to customize the quick access toolbar. Go ahead and click on the drop down arrow and choose all commands. And let's go ahead and scroll down. There it is, switch windows. Double click on it. And let me go ahead and select it and arrow it down. Click OK. So I can switch between books and customers. I can't move the windows around, I can only switch between the two. So really having the windows without that little check box below it saying go ahead and show the tabs, I either have to double click on each of these objects to bring it to the front or add the uh, switch between windows command to the quick access toolbar because on the home tab the windows group isn't there is it? It's only available if you choose the overlapping windows feature, not the tab documents. So there's the second option and then the third option which I originally had it as was, let me go to File, Options, back up to Current Database, and there we go. It was Tab Documents, but also displaying the tabs of those documents. Then click OK. Of course, I have to close out, File, Close Database, and then go ahead and click on the link to reopen it, or click on Open, and it takes me right to my Exercises folder. There's the books, double click. Let's open up a table, double click. And there we go, we have tabs, double click. See, that's so much easier for me as a designer when I'm quickly testing out my tables and making sure they work when I enter in a record. It's got the settings just right. So choose which one works best for you. For me as a designer, I like the tab documents. Now before we learn how to create a database, which is what we're gonna be doing in the next training video, I want to emphasize the four objects that you'll be finding in most access databases, well, at least what we're going to be putting into ours. And as you recall, let me go ahead and open up my database, my exercises folder in my books database, double click on that, are tables, queries, forms, and reports. Now, in access, without any tables, it's useless. You don't have any data because all the data are going to be stored in tables. For example, I've got the books table. I've got my data for the books. I have these fields, book number, title, and book price. And all these fields combined make up a record. So how many records do I have in this table? Well, you can count them up by moving your mouse, one, two, three, or better yet, come down here to the navigation bar, and it says I have one of 10 records. And I can go ahead and use the buttons to advance from one record to the next. Or of course, I can go ahead and click and move around that way. Or I can come down here in the field, delete the number. It's not gonna delete the record. But what I can do is go ahead and replace that number with, let's say, let's go to record two, type it in, hit enter. It takes me right to the second record. And then when I want to add more records, I can just go ahead and come down here and in this blank cell start typing. But we'll learn that in a later training video. For right now, I want to emphasize that you have a table of data, okay? 
We have one on books. We have one on customers. We have one on orders. All the data that we need that we want to keep track of in our database, but in separate tables. Books in one, customers in another, and orders in another table. And then I'll show you later on how to link all that up. Because when it comes to uh, pulling out information, like for example, let's say I want to query or question and find out bits of information that I have in my books table. I don't want to pull up the entire books table, just certain parts of it. For example, let me double click and open up the query. I've got book number and title. As you recall in the book table, I have also book price, but I didn't have that in my query, which is nice because I don't want to come back to the books table and delete that field. If you delete it, it's permanently gone. Don't want to do that. So what we want to do instead, let me go back to the query here, is just say, look, I just want to see these fields, not all of them, just these two. Not only that, but in queries, you can set criteria. You can say, look, of all the books, I just want to see the books that are numbered between 412 and let's say 5,000 or, well, maybe something smaller, maybe like 420 and then it'll just display those without pulling up all the books which is really inefficient because if you have hundreds or thousands of records it's going to take some time to pull that information up it kind of slows it down plus if you have to scroll through it all to get the exact numbers that you're looking for yeah what a waste in any case that's the purpose of the query and again the query is based upon the data that's contained in your table so moving along we've got our forms let me go ahead and double click and open up that now you can enter your data either into the table, which is what we have here by adding a new record, or you can create a pretty form. It's basically a table with a facelift. In other words, when you enter in records into a table, it's from left to right. But in a form, you can take these fields here and move them all over the place. You can control a user's input. You can say, look, the first thing I want you to input is the book number. If you don't have that, then don't even save the record, which you can control in tables, but it just looks a little bit more organized when I can start with the most important thing up at the top, and then maybe section it off and saying this is the book number, title, book price, and then maybe have another section here for the order, another section here for the customer's information. See, I can control where I want and emphasize what data needs to be put in first or to be focused on. So what we enter in here is going to dump it right into the tables. Well, it's based upon the book, the books table. The query, which is based upon the table here, and a query can be based upon more than one table, so that's kind of nice. I can actually base the form upon this query, and that query can be based upon these two tables. So I can have all the information being pulled back into this uh, one form and be able to view it and also enter in the records to be able to distribute that into a query that's covering two or more tables. And we'll discuss that later. So forms based upon tables, queries based upon tables, also reports. Let's go ahead and open up the books report, and there you go. When you need something that's printable, that looks nice, Go ahead and design the report, this object here, and you see how it's laid out, just all pretty. It's a printable form. So I can go ahead and print that off and hand it out at my meetings and say, okay, here's what we're selling for uh, the year 2011. So as I mentioned, if we didn't have tables of data, none of the data would be pulled in here. It would be empty. So having said that, let me go ahead and close out of all these tabs here. I can either click on the X or I can go ahead and right click on one of the tabs and say close or I can right click and say I want to close all. One last thing I want to cover is if you look at the names of these objects they all begin with a three letter prefix like tables TBL I mean that makes sense right TBL table QRY query FRM form RPT reports you might look at that and say okay that's a bit redundant I mean if it's grouped in forms why do I have to have a prefix that identifies that that's a form well, later on, when we get into the design mode of our forms and reports, well, let me show you right now. I'm going to go ahead and open up the report in a double click, and I'm going to go ahead and right click on the tab and go to the design view. Because what you see here is the front end view for the front end user to print off, but we have to design it, right? So in any case, let me to go to the design view. Now, this report is going to be based upon the books table. So let me come up here and click on the property sheet, the source the records are coming from is the books table. Let me click on the drop down arrow. So when I'm designing this report, if you'll notice, if I didn't have those three letter prefixes, I would have, let's see, one books and two books. I wouldn't know which one's the table, which one's the query. Because maybe in the query, I'm only pulling in certain fields or just those things that meet a specific criteria and not all of the records. So that could be a mess. So that's why you want to go ahead and anytime you create an object and save it, give it a name of course but also be sure to put in the uh, three letter prefix for the name of the object TBL for table that way again on the back end 
we know where it's pulling from when we want to pull the records in for this report, maybe from the query books or from the table books. Okay. Now, before we can go ahead and start creating our objects, you know, that we talked about before, the tables, queries, forms, and reports, the tables being the most important because that's where we're going to start storing our data or creating records, we have to create a database, a shell of a program, so we can start creating those objects. To do that, just come over here and let's open up Access. We can either start with a blank database, design it from scratch, and then go ahead and start entering in our information, our records, or we can have it already designed for us in a template and then we just can go ahead and start entering in the records like maybe the template for contacts or a company that does a lot of sales and we need to keep track of our contacts in any case let's start off with a blank database first so go ahead and make sure it's selected or in this case it's highlighted in orange then come down here and click on the create button but before I do that I want to answer two questions what name do I want to give the database and where do I want to dump it into what folder well, it's going to be by default in the exercises folder on my desktop. And as you recall in an earlier training video, I set that default. But I can change it on the fly if, for this instance, this database, I don't want it stored there. I can click on the Browse button, go to the Navigation pane, click on the desktop, and then, you know, find another folder and click OK. I'm going to click Cancel because I do want it in my exercises folder. And then for the file name, the generic name is Database1. Go ahead and click in it once and then click in it again to get your cursor flashing and delete everything to the left of the extension .accdb the extension again is what the operating system assigns to that file so it knows to open up that file that we give the name let's call it computer inventory acc is access db is database so it'll open up in the microsoft access database that's all we need to do go ahead and click create when we do it does two things First of all, it dumps it into that folder, of course, and it gives it a name, the name that we assigned it, Computer Inventory. This is the show of the program. And second of all, it starts us off in the database with a complementary table, which is fine, but I'm not ready to work on my tables yet or to design them. So I'm going to go ahead and close out of that. So congratulations, you've got a database. Now we just need to start creating tables, which we'll learn how to do in the next training video. But before we do that, let me go ahead and uh, close out, go back to my exercises folder, double click, and there you go, there's my database, double click on it. It's a blank empty database. I can go ahead and start creating those objects, but before we do that, let me click on the file, go down to new, and let's see what it looks like to create a database from a template. Let's do contacts. Click on that, opens it up. It's got a few templates here. How about if we use the contacts? Click on that. It comes over here. It doesn't give us too much information. But if I want to go ahead and see what it looks like, again, come down here, click on the download, and instead of the create, it'll download it to your computer. Where is it going to download? Well, by default, to my exercises folder. And what's the name? Contacts. I'm okay with that. Click on download. And then Microsoft gives us a warning saying, hey, this was created by somebody outside of the, uh, I guess, Microsoft company. Are you okay with that? Um, uh, it's up to you. You take your chances. It does give you the warning. I'll go ahead and click accept. Then it downloads it. Pops it open. And this is kind of cool. When it pops it open, this is a form. Can you see that little icon in the upper left hand corner? It's a greeting form and you can see the icons here. Forms. That means it's a form. And it gives you some videos that you can go ahead and click and watch to find out how this database operates or works or how it's set up. Go ahead and click on it, watch the video. So I'm going to go ahead and close out. And there we go. We've got tables, queries, forms, reports. It's all been set up. All you have to do is go ahead and start entering in your records. And here's the uh, form that's open. It's the contact list. Go ahead and start entering your contacts. You see, with the template, you didn't have to design this. You didn't have to set up this field and call it first name. That field, call it last name, company. We're going to learn to do all that from scratch in the next training video. If you don't want to do that, then go ahead and use one of the templates and have it pre-designed for you and see if that works. I'm going to go ahead and close out, and you can see that they're both here in my exercises folder. But I'm going to go ahead and uh, right click on contacts and delete that. Just stick with my database here. Double click and let's go ahead and learn how to create a table in the next training video. As you recall in the previous training video, we learned how to create our first database. In fact, that's over here in my exercises folder. And there it is. Let me double click and open it up. Now my computer inventory database in here, 
I want to keep track of all the computers that our company has purchased. In fact, I want to keep track of the manufacturer, the date we received it, the purchase price, the warranty if it has one or if it doesn't, and also which computer is assigned to what employee. Now once we have the shell of the program, the database created, we want to start creating our objects. And the very first object that we should create ought to be our tables. Because again, without tables, you can't enter in any data or any records. And without any records, you really don't have a database. So to get started, I'm going to come up here and click on the, uh, coincidentally, the Create tab, because here we can create tables, queries, forms, reports. But I want to create tables, so I'm going to the Tables group. Then let me go ahead and click on Table. As you recall in the previous training video, when you created your database, it gave you a complementary table here. It opened it up for you so you can start designing it. But if you closed out of it like I did, you can go back up to the Create tab and, of course, create a, another table or keep creating tables here, as many as you need. So here I can go ahead and start designing it, and then over here in the uh, navigation pane, it's got the uh, generic name. It's going to be that way until I save it and give it a new name. In fact, let me go ahead and do it right now. Come up here on the Quick Access Toolbar, click on Save. As you recall, when it comes to saving our objects, we want to start off with a three-letter prefix that uh, identifies that object. Now this is a table, so the three-letter prefix for tables ought to be TBL. And then go ahead and give it a name for this table. This is all going to be about computers. And then go ahead and click OK and there we go. Updates the name in the uh, navigation pane and also up on my tab here. And if it was a query, we would type in the three letter prefix of QRY, form FRM, and report RPT. Now once we go ahead and we save it, we can start designing this table. We need to add in a bunch of fields and collectively those fields are going to make up a record. So the front end user, like your office person, receptionist, or secretary knows what to enter in. Now the first field by default has already been added for us anytime you create a table, and that's the ID field. Now why does Access do that? Well Access is prompting you and telling you that for every table you create, you ought to have a field that's a unique identifier that makes that record unique. For example, let's say we have a table on employees. If you have a couple of Bob Smiths in your company, does the first name, is that unique? Can you tell which Bob is Bob? How about the last name, Smith? No. How about their address? Yes. Or better yet, you can actually assign them an employee ID number, like EID-001, EID-002, and so on. Or better yet, use their social security number. I mean, that should be unique. It identifies that employee. Now for my computers table, uh, the default here is ID, and it's automatically going to assign a number starting with the number one for each record that's entered in. So the first record, it'll have a number one, the second record, two, three, four, five, six, and so on. Which is fine if that's what I'd like. If I don't, then I can go ahead and change it. And I'll show you how to change that in just a second. But for right now, instead of having just a, the generic name for this, ID, I can go ahead and change the name of that field by double-clicking in it really fast. And once you see that the text is highlighted, that means that that cell or that field is in edit mode. So instead of having just ID, my computers have barcodes, or what are also known as asset tags. So like when you're at the grocery store and, and you go to the checkout, the checker is going to be scanning those codes that are found on those products there, and that's again what a barcode is, or an asset tag. Let me just go ahead and start typing, and it automatically types over that selected text. There it is, asset tag. Once I'm finished, I can go ahead and hit enter on the keyboard, it accepts the name and then bounces over to the next field that says click here to add. Now before it adds the field or allows you to name that field, it says okay, what type of data is allowed in this field? Do you want to just have somebody enter in text? Well, this one's kind of a misnomer here. When it says text, it also accepts numbers, but I'll tell you about the pros and cons of that later on. Then you have just strictly numbers or currency, which is a number, but with a little dollar sign, date and time, and so on. That's a list of some of the fields, or as you recall, in the database you have your four default tabs up at the top, but any time you're working in an object, like we're working on the table here, that's an object, the other objects, you know, like forms, reports, and queries, it also has its own related contextual tabs. In other words, you have the table tools for what I'm working on here is a table. I have the fields tab and the tables tab. The point I'm getting at is that if you want more fields here than just what's listed, you can come over here on the Fields tab for the table to the Add and Delete group, and there it is, More Fields. Click on that, and wow, you get more fields. Instead of just a date, you can choose from Short Date, Medium Date, Long Date. I mean, what's the difference? Well, Short Date's going to be just a bunch of numbers with slashes. Long Date's going to have it all spelled out. Tuesday, January 5th, uh, 2011. 
and that's kind of the shortfall of designing. Let me go ahead and click off in a blank area. Designing your table from the data sheet view. I like doing it from the design view. I mean, that makes sense, right? You want to design your table. You probably ought to do it from the design view because in the design view, you get more flexibility. It shows you what those formats look like. There's a lot of advantages to it, but if you're in a hurry, you can do it this way, which I'm going to go over really quick. So if I want to go ahead and uh, come up here and click on that drop down arrow again and say, okay, I'm adding a new field and the type of data that's acceptable in this field, this field is going to be my manufacturer, the name of the manufacturer of the computers that we purchased. Let me go ahead and select text. After I select it, it says, okay, this field allows text. Let me go ahead and type in the name of the field. And it's going to be manufacturer, hit enter, then it goes to the next field. And it keeps going and going and going. So up at the top, you have the name of the fields. And then down below is where the front end user is going to be entering in the data for the first record, the second record. I mean, every time you enter in a record, it's going to open up a new blank line so you can enter in additional records, which we'll cover in a later training video. Right now, we're just trying to design it so the front end user, your secretary, your receptionist, your front office person knows what they're going to be entering in underneath these fields. This one, again, is going to be automatically generated, and I'll show you how to change that in just a second. But that's as far as I'm going to go for the front end. You get the idea. You can go ahead and uh, add the fields here. Let me go ahead and click off in a blank area. But primarily, the data sheet view, which is what we're in right now, the front end view, is for the front end user to enter in their records. You can design it a little bit. It's limited. You get more options to design this table in the design view. So how do I get to the design view? Well, there's a couple of ways. You can either right click on the tab and go, there it is, design. Click on that. And you can, of course, right click on the tab and go back to your data sheet view, the front end view. Or you can come up here on the home tab to the views group. And you can see when I click on the drop down arrow, you see how the data sheet view below my pointer is highlighted? That means that's the current view that I'm in. If I want to go to design, then select it. Click on it, drop down arrow, go to the data sheet view. In fact, better yet, let me click off in a blank area. It toggles this button right here back and forth between design view and data sheet view. So that's a lot faster without clicking on the arrow and maybe even right clicking. If I just click on it once, there's data sheet view. And you can see there's the design with the pencil and the ruler. To go to that view, click on it, click on data sheet, design, back and forth, we're getting sick. In any case, that's a quick way of toggling back and forth. Now that we're in the design view, a couple of things you want to notice is that up at the top we have a list of our fields that we saw in the data sheet view, the two, asset tag and manufacturer. You also have the data type, which you couldn't tell in the data sheet view unless you clicked on the drop down arrow at first, but here in the design view, it's before me constantly. And then down below you have the properties of the fields up above. Meaning that if I go ahead and select the field, I can go down here and look at additional properties and customize that field a little bit more. But before we do that, let's go ahead and add a few more fields. Let me go ahead and go to the next blank field down below and let's add date received. Hit the tab key. It goes over to the data type. The date should be, when I click on the drop down arrow, about date and time, right? So we can go ahead and select that. Now the advantage again of being in the design view is that I get additional options down below, the properties for this field. So the date and time, do I want it the short date, the medium date, or the uh, long date? If I want to go ahead and change or select a specific type of uh, format for the date, you can either make sure it's selected here, come down here in the field properties and go to the format right here. Or another way to get down to the field properties if I'm up here is just to hit the F6 key on the keyboard. When I hit F6, it automatically dumps my cursor down below and there it's flashing. I mean, you don't want to be up here in another field and go, hmm, I want to change the properties for date received because whatever we have selected, the properties are being displayed down below for. So if I go ahead and make changes here, it's not going to be for date received. I have to select it. Then I can hit F6. It dumps my cursor down below. In any case, I'm in the format field. Click on the drop down arrow, and you can see right now that instead of just guessing what the medium date looks like, it gives us an example there. So let's do short date. And then you'll notice to the left hand side when I make a change down the field properties, it gives me this little lightning bolt, the little icon. When I click on it, it says, do you want to go ahead and update this format that you changed this field to, you know, the short date, to everywhere the date received is being used? Well, this is the first table we're creating, and we just barely inserted the field, so we don't have to update it everywhere it's being used because, well, we haven't started using it yet. But nonetheless, it's there. Okay, let's go ahead and quickly add some more fields. Purchase price, hit the tab key, drop down arrow, how about currency? And then down below, if I hit the F6 key, 
you've got the format which is currency which I can change that and choose something else which I won't let me click off in a blank area you also have the decimal places for your numbers you can have it automatically set and by the way if you don't know what you're looking at here decimal places what does that mean well then just come over to the right make sure your cursor is flashing in that field come over to the right and it will explain that it'll say look the field you're looking at allows you to select the number of digits that are displayed to the right of the decimal separator so if I click on the drop down arrow how many digits do I want if I'm dealing in currency if, if it's auto then it will be two digits after the decimal place or I can say zero and just deal in dollars not in cents in any case I'll go ahead and select it back let me scroll up to auto and then let's do warranty hit the tab key click on the drop down arrow I'm trying to show you as many data types as I can here without going overboard in fact if I just go ahead and click so my cursor's flashing in there and I hit the F1 key on the keyboard it'll bring up the help menu for access and you can see let me expand it it explains the the different type of data that can be used when you select text memos more lengthy where text allows up to 255 characters memo goes up to wow over 63,000 characters so let me go ahead and close out let me click on the drop down arrow I want a yes or no for the warranty does it have a warranty or doesn't it And you can see down in the field properties for that field up above the format is going to be true or false in fact I want to change the format to not say true or false but how about yes or no okay let's shake this up just a bit let me show you another data type for the manufacturer this will be a good example let me click on the drop down arrow now for the manufacturer let's say we only use maybe three manufacturers I don't want the front end user just start typing in or making up manufacturers or maybe they need to get the spelling of the manufacturer correct in other words I want to control the user's input so what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the lookup wizard here and I'm actually going to add a multi-value field that allows me to put in a list of values that the front end user has to choose from that way they can't make an error by typing in and, and making a misspelling of the manufacturer's name so I'll do lookup wizard first of all a wizard Microsoft uses those it just basically says okay I'm gonna ask you a bunch of questions you give me the answers and I'll go ahead and set this up for you so the wizard is gonna ask us in regards to what we want a value to look up and I'm gonna have three values that I want available for the front end user In fact let's go ahead and say I will type in the values that I want the front end user to choose from as opposed to looking up this field from another table I only have one table in any case I'm gonna type it in click next and the first value let me go ahead and type it in is gonna be you see that little pencil there that just means it's in edit mode as soon as I hit the down arrow key the pencil disappears and it says okay I'll accept that first lookup manufacturer which is gonna be global so we purchase our computers from the global manufacturer we also purchase it from this manufacturer spy tech down arrow and finally and then if I just click off in a blank area the pencil disappears it's no longer in edit mode now if your names are a little bit lengthy you can come up here to the right hand uh, side of the column header col1 and you see how my pointer turns into arrows pointing in opposite directions you can click and drag and stretch that open more so you can see what you're typing in in any case that's good enough for now you can actually add additional columns if you want to type in two and hit the tab key and then add spy tech and then put in some additional information that relates to spy tech but you know what I just need one column I'm gonna go ahead and type in one and hit the tab key and these are the three lookup fields that the front end user has to choose from so when it comes to them entering in the manufacturer if they type in spy tech wrong I don't have to worry about the database integrity with a, a gazillion different spellings of spy tech like SPI and TEC or TECH so I got those three listed let me click next and then it says what label would you like I'm gonna go ahead and leave it as manufacturer and then you got two options you want to limit to the list or allow multiple values if you don't choose either one of them it's going to default to limit to list and what that means is that they can only choose one from the list one choice they can either choose global spy tech or macron but if I choose allow multiple values then that means that they can choose well either all three manufacturers which doesn't make sense unless the computer has different parts from the three different manufacturers like maybe the hard drive is from global and then the DVD or blu-ray drive is from spy tech in any case when I'm finished well there you go click finish and then it says you've changed the manufacturer's lookup column to store multiple values you'll not be able to undo this once you save the table are you okay with that do you want to store multiple values say yes and then of course when we go ahead and save it 
So you're going to get a couple of warnings when you start changing your data here, the data type, and I recommend that you don't change it just willy-nilly, especially if you have your uh, database set up and records entered therein, because you could actually, if you change your data type from text to, let's say, some number here, and maybe it's the number with the long format or short format, it may truncate the data that you already have in there, cut it off to actually fit the type of data that you select. So you don't want to do it willy-nilly. You want to get it all done now and design it and plan it out really well. Think of the long term, you know, before you actually set it up. You want to keep that in mind. And we'll talk about that more in detail later. But for right now, let me go ahead and right-click on the uh, tab and go to the data sheet view. And we can go ahead and start entering in our records. Thanks for watching. Hey, as a quick reminder, if you like my video, please give it a thumbs up. You can also click on me and subscribe to my channel to get notified of the latest videos. And for great specials on my products, please see the description below this video.